This is K.M. Wyland, and you are listening to the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode, Archetypal Antagonists for the Mage Arc, Evil and the Weakness of Humankind. It is appropriate that the final archetypal character arc of the life cycle, the mage arc, should be the one to finally confront the ultimate antagonist within the human experience. This is, of course, evil in all its abstraction. As the final arc, the mage symbolizes the end of life and presumably its fulfillment. Because the mage is such a powerful and rare personage, the mysteries of his arc are ones few writers ever personally embody, but still ones we instinctively speculate about. And it is in the speculating that we sometimes are fortunate enough to offer to ourselves, and perhaps to our readers, a glimpse into greater truths and possibilities. By its very numinosity and mysteriousness, the mage arc offers the opportunity for its archetypal antagonists to be personified in many different ways. As we've noted throughout this supplementary series, the archetypal antagonists faced within these successive life arcs grow increasingly less dualistic and more abstract as we go. In the first act of life, the maidens and the heroes necessarily define evil as the other whom they are resisting and from whom they need to individuate. Indeed, they are therefore inclined to then insist that the very nature of otherness must indicate evil. By the time the crone makes peace with death, it rather seems there is no concept of evil left to confront. But the wisdom of the mage sees a bigger picture that could only be instinctively and incompletely grasped in the earlier arcs. Perhaps most surprisingly, what the mage recognizes is less evil as a vast and primal entity, but rather as something comparatively small, the evil that is the destruction and unhealth in the hearts of humankind. And so the antagonist the mage faces, whether portrayed in metaphor or not, is ultimately one he himself cannot defeat. Indeed, the larger part of his arc is centered around the struggle of realizing that to exert his great power in taking control of the situation and therefore robbing autonomy and choice from the younger denizens of the kingdom would be perhaps the greatest evil of all. More than any of the preceding archetypal character arcs, that of the mage can be seen as a passing of the torch. As the final life arc, the mage's story ends, whether literally or symbolically, with the mage's departure from this world. In future, he won't be around in any guise to give the younger arcs a helping hand. From now on, they're going to be on their own. And so the great need represented by the mage arc is that of his somehow making sure the kingdom will be okay in his absence, that the cycle of life will roll on, hopefully in health and goodness. His great challenge, his final challenge, is that of resisting the temptation to control this outcome, knowing that to do so would be to intrinsically destroy that natural cycle anyway. He would, in those poignant words, meet his destiny on the road he took to avoid it. Is there any antagonistic force so archetypal as that of evil? However much symbolic nuance resides within archetypes, they are by their very nature simplistic. They are black and white, without shades of gray, or even moral complexity, per se. And evil, of course, always seems very black indeed. By its very starkness, the concept of evil can sometimes be difficult to write about. These days, our postmodern minds may argue with one another about what constitutes evil, or even if it really exists. 
And yet, conceptually, it continues to show up in our fictional dreamscapes over and over again, with varying degrees of resonance and applicability. Although evil can be, and often is, personified through the undeniably destructive and imbalanced actions of certain individuals, we see it portrayed most explicitly in fiction as nameless, faceless monstrosities. For example, the horror genre, although not often featuring mage arcs, is designed around representing faceless evil in various guises. Serial killers are often masked, and monsters are often mindless and soulless. There is no explanation for evil's actions. It is beyond reason or even motive sometimes. Antagonists within the younger archetypal arcs may often be seen as evil, and indeed may truly be so, but they are usually personified in some way. These arcs are more concerned with simple conflicts that offer clear winners and losers. Whatever the antagonistic manifestation, it will be defeated in the form of the protagonist's current lie. The end, all is well, the kingdom can exist happily ever after. But the very nature of the life arc cycle indicates that this happily ever after is only true until a new antagonistic force interrupts the character's life in the form of a new lie that he or she must overcome. Theoretically, within this model of archetypal arcs, the mage represents the finality of this cycle. Naturally, this is not literally true, both because this cycle is but one possible archetypal exploration of life, and also because infinite concepts, such as archetypes, can have no truly finite ends, no matter how much fiction would like to make it so. Nevertheless, within this model, the mage represents the fulfillment of the cycle, and therefore an ultimate showdown with the single great antagonist who has, in fact, been represented in all of the limited mindsets overcome throughout previous arcs. The evil the mage faces may, of course, be represented as a great force that threatens the kingdom, such as we find in so many fantasies, and most notably with the great eye of Sauron in the Lord of the Rings. Even if this force employs a mortal army, as with Sauron's legions of orcs, the force itself represents an infinitude of some kind. More specifically in its effects, it is usually recognized by the fact that it would eliminate free choice. In fantasy, it may literally do this by mind-slaving people, or more practically, it may either exert a powerful tyranny and or kill people, thereby robbing them of any choice at all. Therefore, we can see how evil need not always be represented on a grand scale. If your mage character is Gandalf the Grey, he will, of course, require a grand theater of metaphor in which to operate. But if your character is to appear in realistic fiction, or semi-realistic fiction, then the evil he faces can be as realistically small as simply the potential corruption infecting the heart of one single being, such as Will Smith's Bagger Vance faces in the heart of Matt Damon's character. Now, evil is a very big word and a very big antagonist, but in many mage stories, this evil manifests in this smallest of ways, not even in an obviously evil person, but simply in an ordinary person's weakness. Or what mage character Queenie in Lark Rise to Candleford calls human frailty. And this weakness is most poignantly obvious, not in the hearts of the mage's enemies, but in the hearts of those very youngsters he loves and would mentor, the maidens, heroes, queens, kings, and even crones, whom he is about to leave behind. The mage's great challenge is not to use his accumulated life's power to destroy the evil, but rather to gather his wisdom to avoid the temptation of turning himself into that very evil by taking away control and free will from these younger, weaker characters. In a triumphant mage arc, his very example and his great wisdom 
will be enough to inspire positive and necessary change in his wards. It is not the mage who defeats the evil in the end, but those in the kingdom who have overcome the weakness in their own hearts. To the degree the mage tries to protect the younger characters from facing the full conflict, or to the degree he attempts to control or manipulate their choices, he becomes evil. And because he is a supremely advanced and powerful archetype, this fatal weakness in his own human heart will prove more dangerous than whatever evil he resisted in the beginning. Now, depending on how you choose to represent evil as an antagonist within your story, you may emphasize it either as a huge and overwhelming force or as a much smaller conflict within a single relationship. There is the opportunity within the mage arc to either go really big and epic or really microscopic and intimate. In a story that emphasizes evil as a force, this force will usually motivate the external conflict. It may even create a great war in which forces of good and evil oppose each other. But even within the forces of good, the evil will creep in on a more personal and interrelational level as the mage witnesses the weakness and temptation encountered by younger characters. By contrast, a story that emphasizes this potential for weakness within younger characters, and indeed the mage himself, will usually focus more intimately on the consequences of the human character's choices and actions. To the degree the mage's influence fails, or to the degree the mage himself manipulates outcome, evil will result in ways both large and small, creating plot obstacles and conflict. For the mage protagonist, the climactic encounter is less about defeating an enemy and more about surrendering to the end of life. Whether literally or metaphorically, he steps out of this mortal theater, leaving the younger archetypes to fight the battles they are meant to fight as they continue to progress through their own life cycles. Although not a protagonist, Master Ugwe in the animated film Kung Fu Panda offers a beautiful example of a character who fulfills all the best qualities of a true and positive mage. With utter love, but absolutely no attempt at control, he recognizes when it is time to leave the challenges of this life to those whom he has trained up behind him. In many ways, the evil represented by antagonistic forces in a mage arc is simply the lie the characters believe. If the younger characters are able to manifest their own positive change arcs and overcome their individual lies from whatever stage of their journeys, the evil will be both defeated and transmuted. And in exemplifying this, the mage may not directly determine the end of the story's conflict, but he will at least initiate his beloved others to do so. And so we come to the end of our exploration of archetypal antagonists in association with the life arc cycle. Naturally, the 12 archetypal antagonists presented here are but a tiny fraction of possible archetypes to choose from in portraying your antagonist characters. However, these archetypal forces, whether portrayed literally or abstractly, are the ones that create the practical and thematic conflicts for each of the archetypal character arcs. Even if you choose to use other archetypal antagonists in your stories, understanding how these forces integrally interact with life progressions can be helpful in crafting deeply resonant and cohesive fiction. So, I hope you'll stop by the blog and tell me your opinion. Can you think of any further examples of evil and the weakness of humankind as archetypal antagonists in mage arc stories? If you'd like to be part of the word player community over on my site and join in the conversation on this subject, be sure to stop by the website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. You can always find a transcript of the most recent podcast 
and add your voice to the discussion by visiting the first post on the site's homepage. And don't forget that if you're looking for an older post, you can always find those by putting the podcast title in the search field at the top of the right-hand column. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music, or whatever your favorite podcast platform may be. And if you'd like to do something to support helping writers become authors, it always means a ton if you're able to leave just a quick rating or review on your site of choice. Also, many thanks to those who support my work on Patreon. Your patronage helps make helping writers become authors, and it's many resources available to writers everywhere. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can find out more at patreon.com slash kmwyland. Thank you so much for listening to the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast, and be sure to check back again next week.